rock, the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seemed to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other grounds is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand.
sand. Praise the Lord. But before we reach, shall we just have a moment of prayer? Father, we're asking that you will open our eyes of understanding as we read your word today. We're asking that relevant passages that really speak to our present needs and problems, spiritually and physically and materially, you will impress upon our hearts. Be with us, enlighten us, instruct us, teach us as we read together now. In Jesus' name, I pray. We'll continue with the reading now. Micah. Chapter 2. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it, because it is in the power of their hand. And they covet fields, and take them by violence, and houses, and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. In that day shall one take up a parable against you, and lament with a doleful lamentation, and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. Therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. Prophesy ye not, say to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them, that they shall not take shame. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the Spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not our words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Even of late my people is risen up as an enemy. Ye pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. The women of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses, from their children have ye taken away my glory forever. Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. Because it is polluted, it shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. Surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bozra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The breaker is come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. Chapter 3 And I said, Here I pray you, O heads of Jacob and ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Who hate the good and love the evil? Who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones? who also eat the flesh of my people, and flay their skin from off them. And they break their bones, and chop them in pieces, as for the pot, and as flesh within the cauldron. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth, and by peace. And he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Therefore night shall be unto you, that ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you, that ye shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded, yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment, and of might, to declare unto Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. For this I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob, and prince the house of Israel abhor judgment and pervert all equity. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Therefore shall I forsake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Just listen to the Bible reading, and we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, 
a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. Pray for grace that you will do as you have learned the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray.
thank you for the bible study thank you lord because there's life in the word power in the word and we pray that the life and the power in the word will work in every life in jesus name we're asking lord that the cross of christ will do wonders in every life thank you lord for the answer in jesus name we pray God bless you. We're continuing in our series of Bible studies in Galatians. And today we're coming to Galatians chapter 6, the final verses of the epistle. We're reading from verse 11. Please open your Bible. Galatians chapter 6, reading from verse 11. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Then in verse 12, it says, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In verse 13, it says, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but the desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in the flesh. Verse 14 then says, but God forbid that I should glory, save except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Verse 16, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Verse 17. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Verse 18, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Tonight, we're looking at those verses of scripture, and you will see that he spoke about those who glory in the flesh. That is the glory in the marks of circumcision they have in the flesh. The glory in the things they have accomplished in the flesh. No grace, no godliness, no goodness of God, no hope of eternal life, no salvation, no conversion, no change of life, no transformation. And their spirit had not been touched and transformed by the Lord. All they have to talk about is what happened to them in the flesh. 
their parents circumcised them on the eighth day and they carry that mark of circumcision and they say I'm a circumcised Israelite and the glory only in that in the flesh but Paul the apostle said I could do that if I wanted to but there's no value in that I could do that but that one doesn't carry eternal blessing I glory in the cross of Christ there he died for me there he shed his blood there he said it is me there he took my guilt away there he took my sins away there he gave me the hope of life eternal because of what Christ has done I glory in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that's why we're talking tonight on the glory of a new creature in Christ if any man be in Christ is a new creature old things are passed away even the old covenant everything of the old covenant and of the fleshless circumcision everything has passed away and now he becomes a new creature and all things have become new and because of that newness that new life and because of the new covenant and because of what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary I glory in the cross of Christ the glory of a new creature in Christ we're dividing the message tonight to three parts number one the constraint to be circumcised number two the cross for the crucified number three the character of the new creature look at number one number one the constraint to be circumcised in galatians chapter 6 reading from verse 11 it said in verse 11 you see how large a letter i have written unto you with mine own hands and then in verse 12 it says as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ verse 13 in verse 13 for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law but desire to have a fear to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh we're dividing this to three parts number one the fervent concern of a faithful apostle number two the forceful constraint of false apostles number three the fatal consequence of faulty attachment look at number one there number one is the fervent concern of a faithful apostle look at verse 11 in galatians chapter 6 verse 11 you see how large a letter i have written unto you with my own hands you see that that's clear why did he do that and what do we get from that he was telling them i could have had another person to write this and send it to you but because of the concern i have for you you are in my heart i love you with an undying love and even though you are being confused by judaizers who are trying to compel you and constrain you to be circumcised i know i'm busy i go here to philippi i go here to the corinthians i go there to the ephesians i go to all those colossians but then because you are so precious to me and i'm concerned about you look see how large a letter I have reached unto you with my own hands the fervent concern of a faithful apostle. Look at chapter 4 of uh, Galatians, chapter 4, verse 17. They zealously affect you. Those who are trying to compel you to be circumcised, and there's no value in that circumcision. It doesn't bring salvation, and they zealously running after you, 
but not well ye they will exclude you all they're doing and preaching to you and compelling you to do will exclude you from the kingdom of God will exclude you from the salvation that Christ brought on the cross that ye might affect them all they want is for you to you know for you to bend to them and to have affection for them and to hold them superior to every other one that ye might affect them look at verse 18 in verse 18 it says but it's it's good to be zealously affected always that uh, in a good thing uh, and not only when uh, I am present with you. Now, you see why he wrote to them uh, in verse 19. In verse 19, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again uh, until Christ be formed in you. He said, this is the personal com uh, concern I have for you. This is the fervent concern I have for you because you are going astray and you are listening to the people that are thinking salvation comes through circumcision. I have this concern for you and I want you, I'm traveling in prayer. I'm traveling in ministry in, until Christ be formed in you again. Now, when people write like this and they keep and they give themselves to that writing, it's because they have a concern for the people they are writing about. Look, for example, at Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 1. Here is Luke, and imagine this that somebody is going to write to an individual, and he writes chapter 1 to chapter 24 of the gospel according to Luke. That's the real concern. He wanted the person was writing to, to get the real gist of the gospel and to have the depth of the gospel and to have to experience the transforming power of the gospel. And he says, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. But students says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Then in verse 3, it says, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee one person to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. That's a great concern for you to sit down and then to write all those historical things about Christ is healing his mercy, his miracles, his uh, message, and everything he did until he went to the cross and he died on the cross of Calvary. Long chapters, 24 chapters, writing to one man. That means he was really concerned. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, that thou mightest know. Thou just one person, that you might know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. The same kind of concern and the same kind of passion that Paul the Apostle had and he said, you Galatians, see how large a letter I've written unto you with my own hands. I'm concerned about you. Take the content of this letter the content of this epistle, the content of this message, apply to you. Be as concerned for your eternal destiny as I am concerned for that destiny. We're looking at number two. Number two tells us the forceful constraint of false apostles. It tells us in Galatians chapter 6 verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. There are people like these uh, Judaizers, false apostles and false prophets and false uh, preachers. They do not have anything to show except something that belongs to the flesh, the glory in the flesh. All they want to do is to emphasize the tradition of the elders. 
wash your hands that's flesh and then don't do this and do this that's all the flesh external things that's all about the flesh and it says as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh they constrain you to be circumcised these galatians were gentiles and the Gentiles had nothing to do with circumcision. Circumcision was given to Abraham and the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites. But the Judaizers said, you must be circumcised. They constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. They avoided persecution. Whatever the Jewish people wanted them to say, that's what they said, so that the Jewish people will be appreciating them and praising them. You are following the tradition of the elders and you are following the, the message of circumcision. There's no persecution for you. But Paul, the apostle, said, there's no point in that. That's a waste of time. That's superficial. All you're doing is that you're making them to look like other people look like the Jews and look like there's no salvation in that and he said even if persecution came he will rather suffer persecution for the cross of Christ which these people were not able were not willing to do they were false apostles and these were the false apostles constraining the people to be circumcised look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 11, reading from verse 13 for such are false apostles such are false apostles there are true disciples there are false disciples there are true apostles there are true uh, there are false apostles there are false uh, preachers there are true preachers of the gospel of the Lord these ones emphasizing circumcision that doesn't change the heart circumcision that does not bring salvation circumcision that does not lead to life eternal it says they are false apostles these ones that have only the righteousness that is superficial that is external super, superficial things that will not touch their character will not touch their behavior religion without righteousness superficiality without salvation sanctimonious attitude without real circumcision of heart and without sanctification he said these are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves unto into the apostles of christ that is they'll go out and testify i'm an apostle of christ it's not what they say it's not the card they give out it's not the thing they say about themselves it's the real thing their own lives have their lives been changed and the people they are preaching to they're preaching circumcision to have those lives been changed by their fruits you shall know them is the fruit of the new life the fruit of true righteousness and the fruit of a change of heart of a change of mind the fruit of a turning around that makes us see that this fruit shows is a new creature in Christ. But these false apostles, they only talk about themselves as if they were true apostles. Look at uh, verse 14 there. In verse 14, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. In verse 15, it says in verse 15, therefore, it is no great thing if his minister. Ah, the false apostles are not ministers of Christ They are ministers of Satan The people who preach circumcision And they only stay with external outward religion And there's no internal change There's no internal transformation The Bible says there the uh, ministers of Satan. It says, therefore, it is no great thing if the ministers of Satan also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. But look at the final end. Look at the final judgment. Whose end shall be according 
to their works. Acts chapter 15, reading from verse 1. In Acts chapter 15, verse 1, and certain men, these are the people, that will go to the converts and constrain them to be circumcised. These are the people, the gospel, the people have heard, they said that's not enough. The salvation, they said that's not enough. The repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they say that's not enough. These men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. They said Calvary is not enough. They said the sacrifice of Christ is not enough. They say the grace of God that bringeth salvation, they said, that's not enough. They say what Christ did, the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ on the cross, they said, that's not enough. You must still keep their tradition. You must still go through the circumcision. A, a man must take the knife, surgical knife, and perform the fleshly rite and ceremony of that circumcision to complete the work of Christ. They said, it's Christ and the person that circumcises that will make the salvation right. Are there people like that today that say that Christ is not enough? Salvation not enough? Is crucifixion not enough? Is sacrifice where you became our substitute? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. They said is taking away the sin of the world is not enough. You must add the ceremony and the outward uh, compelling uh, rituals of these people before salvation can be complete. That's why you need to be very careful. Anybody coming to you, any literature getting to you, any idea getting to you, any false doctrine getting to you, saying that Christ is not enough, Calvary is not enough, and all that Christ has done is not enough, you must add their dogma if you are going to be saved these people said except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses ye cannot be saved look at verse 24 in verse 24 it says for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your souls saying ye must be circumcised and keep the Lord look at the last line there to whom we gave no such commandment the apostles came together in Jerusalem and they examined the issue and they said these people that have gone out from us and they are telling you be circumcised be circumcised they said we give them no such commandment. And Peter would have said, when I preach in chapter 2, and many people, they gave their lives to the Lord, and they were baptized, 3,000 of them, I didn't bring in circumcision. And when they said, by what name have you done this? And I said, there's no salvation in any other. But it's in the name of Jesus. I didn't talk about circumcision. And when uh, the people, People that came and the shadow of Peter was healing them and were preaching the gospel. All we said is that Christ is the Savior. He remembered and reminded them I went to the house of Cornelius and I preached the gospel to them. And while I was speaking, the Holy Ghost came on them. I didn't talk about circumcision. They said, we didn't send them. We don't preach that. We preach Christ crucified and Christ and Christ only. And Christ as you believe on what Christ has done. Salvation is yours already. 
I said salvation is just already. I will not allow anyone to come in and constrain and compel any of us to say that must go through their ritual. There's no ritual. Redemption has come through Jesus Christ. And that redemption is enough and is complete. And I pray that your faith will remain in the redemption given by Christ in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three, the fatal consequence of faulty attachment. Paul the Apostle was actually warning the Galatians, if you have attachment to these people and you're not able to separate yourself from them and they, they have the impact on you, they have the, they oppress you with their message and you cannot get yourself out of them, detach yourself from them. The consequence is your eternal destiny will be at stake. It tells us in Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 13. It says, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the Lord, because the circumcision does not have the power to give you a new life and to give you a new direction and to give you a new heart. Therefore, these themselves who are emphasizing the circumcision, they do not keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. That they may glory in your flesh. They don't glory in God in your flesh. They don't glory in the cross in your flesh. They don't glory in the transformation of life. That praise the Lord, I brought that person into a new experience and look at the transformation and look at the newness of life. They cannot glory in the newness of life because circumcision, that outward religion, does not bring a change of life. And what's the fatal consequence? Look at chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 6. I marvel that she has so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Verse 7, it says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert adulterate confuse, dilute, and turn the gospel to another thing, pervert the gospel of Christ. Then in verse 8, it says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. In verse 9, it says, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man, false prophet, any man, false apostle, any man preaching false doctrine, preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Why was he so strong like that? Look at chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 2. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, these people are putting pressure on you, be circumcised, be circumcised, but have repented, but I'm born again, I'm the joy of the Lord and the joy of salvation within me, I have a new life. No, 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 that's not enough. You must be circumcised. If you yield to the pressure of the false apostle, if you yield to the pressure of the false prophets, if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. It's like you've renounced your salvation. You've given up your salvation. It's like you've given up your Christian life. It's like you've given up the total provision of grace. It's like you've given up Calvary. You've given up the cross of Christ. If ye be circumcised, Christ 
shall profit you nothing. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that is a debtor to do the whole law. You have to now go back and then begin to sacrifice animals. You have to go back and then be observed in you know, all the little, little details of the Old Testament law. And you can't do that. All the priests, the ministry is cancelled. All the high priests of the Old Testament, they're no more functioning. And heaven has closed the door to the old covenant. And heaven is not going to listen to the old covenant rituals and ceremonies. And if you go back to circumcision, you have to go back to the whole law, you are lost forever. In verse 4, it tells us Christ has become of no effect unto you. You can't have salvation. It's of no effect to you. Sanctification is of no effect to you. Holiness is of no effect to you. In my house, in the Father's house, how many mansions, all that is not available for you anymore. Everything Christ has done on the cross of Calvary has no value for you anymore. In short, you are caught away from Christ. You are caught away from eternal life. You are caught away from heaven. You are caught away from eternal fellowship with God in heaven. If you go back to circumcision, if you yield to the pressure the people are giving you, Christ is become of no effect unto you whosoever are justified by the law. Ye are falling from grace. It was a warning them because of the concern he had for them. And the, the Lord has the same concern for us. He's done everything we need for our salvation, for our redemption. It's done everything we need for eternal life. It's done everything we need for sanctification. It's done everything we need to get into heaven. And I pray you'll come directly to him and Calvary will solve all your spiritual, physical, eternal problems in Jesus' name. Can I hear any amen there? Number two now, we're coming to point number two, the cross for the crucified. It tells us in Galatians chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 14. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul the apostle said, as for me, I'm a Jew too. That's what he was saying. As for me, I used to believe in that circumcision. As for me, I was persecuting the people that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I saw him. I met him. He even took me to the third heaven. And I saw there that anyone that is going to get to that paradise and to the third heaven, the way of the cross leads there. The way of Calvary leads there. The way of Christ for what he did for us on the cross leads there. And therefore he said, but God forbid that I should go back into circumcision, go back to the old covenant, and go back to the rituals and the rites and the ceremonies of the old covenant. Say, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Three things we're looking at. Number one, number one, the wonder of the cross of Christ. Number two, the world that is crucified to the new creatures. And then number three, the work of the crucified with Christ. Look at number one, number one, the wonder of the cross of Christ. Already I said it in the first part of that verse, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? What do you glory? 
What do you believe? What do you center your faith, your conviction, your confidence only on the cross of Christ? Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 13. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who was sometimes far off at midnight by the blood of Christ were far away from God. It's only the cross and the blood, the death of Christ on the cross that brings us near. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He said circumcision could not do that. Actually circumcision separated the Jews from the Gentiles is the cross of Christ that has united us, reconciled us with God, and also united us with one another. He said, I glory in that cross. I praise the Lord for his death and sacrifice on the cross because that is the only thing that could have brought peace and broken down, could have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Look at verse 15. It says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making a peace and then in verse 16 it says and that he might reconcile both unto god in one body by the cross that he might reconcile both the jew and the gentile might reconcile them unto god by the cross he said that's why i glory in the cross have been slain the enmity thereby in uh, Colossians chapter 1 reading from verse 19 Colossians 1 verse 19 for it pleased the father that in him shall all fullness dwell in Christ shall all fullness dwell and the fullness will flow into us by what he did on the cross he said that's why i glory in the cross in verse 20 in verse 20 it says and having made peace through the blood of his cross having made peace we had no peace when we were enemies of god we had no peace when we were helpless sinners in the world is the cross that has brought the help has brought the grace has brought the goodness of god and is the cross that has now brought peace into our heart and peace between us and the everlasting father and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself to reconcile all people unto himself all people at that time all people at this time to reconcile everyone to himself by him i say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven then in verse 21 he says and you that was sometime alienated separated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now i see reconciled all by the cross all by the cross and then he tells us in verse 22 he says in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and you know, nobody can get to heaven without being holy. And it's the cross that comes and walks in us and walks through us and makes us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Then in verse 23, it says, if ye continue, if you don't deviate from the revelation of what the cross has done, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature that is under heaven whereof I Paul am made a 
minister. He says, that's why I glory in the cross, because of what the cross has provided what the cross has done and what the cross has prepared for us and prepared us for. It says reconciliation with God, redemption from God, righteousness in Christ, all come in through the cross of Christ. And what we couldn't have done by ourselves, what we couldn't have been by ourselves is the cross of Christ, is death on the cross, the blood is shed on the cross, the substitutionary sacrifice image on the cross. That is what has provided reconciliation, redemption, righteousness, and entrance into heaven. He said, that's why I glory in the cause of Christ. Look at chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, blotting out. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us. All the things we did wrong. All the sins were committed. Many, many of them. Hundreds and thousands of sins were committed. Uh, they, they are more than the ears of our head. We cannot even number our past transgressions. He said there was handwriting of ordinances against us. Which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Nailing it to his cross. He said, that's why I glory in the cross. And when you think of what Paul, the apostle, had done, and he said, I'm the chief of all sinners. I did this, I did this, I did that. He said, I cannot even number and count them. And then the glory of it, the joy of it is that everything I did had been nailed to the cross of Jesus. The same thing with you. Everything you've done in the past, you bundle everything together and you come and drop at the feet of Jesus and Christ paid it all for you. I said Christ paid each all for you. And so everything of the past is now nailed to his cross. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, And I've been spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in each. All those principalities and powers, they could have ruined your life, wrecked your life for all eternity. But Christ on the cross destroyed, defeated the principalities and powers for you. That's why you glory in the cross. Look at number two here. Number two, the world that is crucified to new creatures. We're coming back to Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me. By whom the world is crucified unto me. What did he mean by that? Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. There is evil in the world. Evil that will hinder any man, every man in his soul, in his spirit, in his body, in his work, in his profession, in his lifestyle that will hinder with powers of darkness and powers of evil. And then he said, Christ, on the cross of Calvary, delivered us from this present evil world. It says, that's why I glory in the cross, because it is through that cross of Jesus Christ, he delivered him. He set him free from all the evil that the world could pounce upon him and could bring to his life. He says, according to the will of God and our Father, is by that cross, the evil, the devil, 
and all that Satan could do to harass our lives and to destroy our lives and to block our view that we cannot even see the way to heaven. It is that cross that helps us to be able to see the way. And the Spirit of God says, this is the way. Walk ye therein. That's why we center our faith, our hope, our love on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 5 of Galatians, reading from verse 24. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 24. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh, all the works of the flesh that the devil would have used to uh, just make us a wreck and make us a perpetual permanent backslider that we couldn't have any strength to stand stand in righteousness now because of that cross of christ all those things are crucified and we have crucified the flesh with the affections and the laws in first john chapter 2 reading from verse 15 first john Chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world will extract, will drain, will suck out the love of God, the love of the Father from us. And it is the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ that helps us that that world that would have taken the love of God from our heart is the cross that crushes that thing and cancels that thing, crucifies that thing so that we're not pulled or drawn by the world anymore. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. All those, the lust of the flesh, the desires for defilement in the flesh, and all the lust of the eyes, the things that attract people into destruction in the world, and the pride of life that will separate a man, a woman, anyone from God throughout eternity is the cross of Christ applied to our lives that crucifies the world unto us and we're free. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, it says, And the world passes away. The things that do not have lasting value that will take us away from heaven, the things that do not have eternal value or permanent value that will have taken us away from heaven is the cross of Jesus Christ that crucifies the world unto us. That world passeth away and the loss thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You'll abide forever live forever in the victory of the cross in the triumph of the cross because that cross crucified the world to us we're coming to number three here number three the walk of the crucified with christ we'll come back to galatians chapter 6 verse 14 but god forbid that i should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and then I unto the world. The world is crucified unto me first, and then I am crucified to the world. And there's a complete separation. When anyone was crucified on the cross, 
the people will not own him the people will not have any attachment to him the people will totally disown him because God said is everyone that hangs upon a tree and he says now the world has nothing to do in me and I have nothing that I desire in the world because on the one hand, the world is crucified unto me, and I reject the world. I denounce the world. I throw away the world, and I am crucified to the world. And the world also rejects me. And the world, the world says, I'm not part of their system. The world says, they are going this direction. I am going a different direction. I am crucified to the world. It tells us in Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 6, knowing this that our old man is crucified with him our old man the old life the old character the old habit the old tendencies the old propensity the old controlling factor inside the man that old man our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin he said i'm crucified to the world and the world has no controlling power over me anymore and the sin in the world has no irresistible power or propelling force over me anymore that henceforth we should not serve sin look at verse 7 in verse 7 for he that is dead is freed from sin he that is dead crucified to the world and crucified to all the actions of the world he that is dead is freed from sin it tells us in galatians chapter 2 verse 20 galatians chapter 2 verse 20 i am crucified with christ i identify with christ i the real me the old me the old nature the propelling force of my life the drive the passion of my life the things i used to love the things i used to do i the one that used to assert myself and say this is who i am and this is what i'm going to do and then he always went the wrong way he said that i is crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the face of the Son of God a new life has come I do not live by the ideologies of the past of the old life now I live by the trust and the confidence and the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me what the conclusion to that Colossians chapter 3 reading from verse 1 in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 if you then be risen with Christ you, you were crucified with Christ you died with Christ and now you are risen with Christ if you then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God in verse 2 it says set your affection you're crucified you've died with Christ you have risen with Christ set your affection set your love set your desire and set your goal and set everything you have is says set your affection on things above not on things on the earth in verse 3 it says for ye are dead and your life is seed with Christ in God and now look at what results the hope you have because of 
been crucified with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall appear with him in glory. A good, good amen. amen. We're coming to point number three here. Point number three, the character of the new creature. We come to Galatians chapter 6 and we're reading from verse, th verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. But a new creature. In verse 16, it says, and as many as walk according to this rule. Which rule? The rule that in Christ alone, on the, on the cross alone, Calvary alone, in what he did on the cross of Calvary, that is the only glory that we have. Circumcision, no glory. Old covenant, no glory personal self-righteousness no glory as many as walk by this rule of glory in the cross of christ alone it says peace be on them and mercy and upon the israel of god three things we're looking at number one the identity of the true Israel of God. Number two, the image of the transformed Israel of God. Number three, the inheritance of the triumphant Israel of God. Look at number one. Number one is the identity of the true Israel of God. As you look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And then in verse 16, it says, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace on them and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. God. How do we identify the Israel of God? The true Israel of God. It tells us in Romans chapter 9, reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Not as though the word of God has taken on effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. They are not all true Israelites, which are of Israel. In verse 7, it says, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham in the natural, are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh circumcised, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. The promise we have in Christ that the seed of the woman will come. It will bruise the heel of, uh, of the seed and that is Satan will bruise the heel of the seed and he the son of God and he the seed of the woman will bruise his said those who have taken refuge in that promise those who have taken their redemption from the promise those who have righteousness on the basis of the promise of what the seed of the virgin has done and now we have salvation we have redemption we have total change of life we become new creatures in christ those are the true israel of God. They are counted for the seed. Look at chapter 2 of Romans. Romans chapter 2 verse 28. It says, for he is not a Jew in a real sense which is one outwardly neither is 
that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Verse 29, in verse 29, but he is a Jew in the real sense, this is the true Israel of God, which is one inwardly, inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but is of God. Those whose hearts and spirits have been circumcised and the old nature, the depraved nature had been taken away from the heart. Those are the people that are the true Israel of God. We're coming to number two here, the image of the transformed Israel of God. Look at Galatians chapter 6 verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Peace on them, peace on them. What's the image of the real, of the true transformed Israel of God? In Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 29. For whom he did for known, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You see that? Circumcision did not conform those Jews to the life of Christ. In fact, they were so separated from Christ, they said, crucify him. But it is what he has done that we believe, and that then makes us conform to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Second Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 18. The image, the image of the transformed Israel of God. But we all, with open face beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed, are transformed into the same image. It is as we behold the glory of the Lord, as we behold the transformation that he can do, that he can make in any life, in every life, looking at how he transformed Saul to become Paul and the life totally changed and the life totally turned around and he could say he was a new creature in Christ and that circumcision mattered not anymore to him but the transforming power of the cross and we see the change in that man and he gloried in that transforming power he says it's the same thing for everyone that has will behold him as we believe him, as we gaze on him, as we look at him, who is the finisher, the author, and the finisher of our faith. He said, beholding him like that, as if we see him in a mirror, is what changes us into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Look at Galatians, uh, Galatians uh, 4, 2 Corinthians rather, chapter 5 verse 17. It says in chapter 5 verse 17, therefore, if any man, anytime, anywhere, if any man, anyone who believes the Lord, any time, any age, any decade, any century, he believes in the Lord. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. The old life is gone. The old selfish life, self-centered life, all that is gone. The old sinful life, all that is gone. The old copycat heart, copying the rest of the world. The other people, this is what they do in their unconverted state, in their old life. And he does the same thing when you come to Christ. 
and you believe on what Christ did on the cross of Calvary and that power of the cross of Christ has an indelible mark in your soul, in your spirit, in your life. All things pass away. Behold, all things. There's no sin you are cherishing. There's no sin you're still hiding. There's no sin you're embracing. Totally new life, new life from the inside because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Your outward life is a reflection of what is on the inside of you. And when the cross of Christ has totally cancelled and crucified and taken away all that old life, then you become a total new creature. Behold, all things have become new. In verse 21, verse 21 tells us, For he has made him, he, the heavenly Father, has made him, Christ, to be seen for us, as if he was the one that committed our sin. He became the sin offering for us, who knew no sin, that we now, because he became the sin offering for us, a sacrifice, a substitute, and our Savior, and because he's done that for us, we now might be made the righteousness of God in him. His image is transplanted into our hearts because of the cross. We're coming to number three. Number three is the inheritance of the triumphant Israel of God. The inheritance of the triumphant Israel of God. We're looking at Galatians chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be unto them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Look at verse 17. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. He had been talking to the Corinthians. He said, let, them no, let no man trouble you. He that troubles you and he brings a perverted gospel, let him be a cause. Now he turns it to himself and he says, henceforth, from now on, let no man trouble me. All those people that were coming to ask questions, how about circumcision? How about uh, Abraham? How about uh, Moses? I about the law and it troubled him unnecessarily with irrelevant questions on circumcision. He said, let no man trouble me for I bear in my body. I bear in my body. You know those people, they were saying they have the mark of circumcision that they were bearing in their body. He said, don't trouble me with that. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. All the persecution he went through and all the stoning that he went through. All the beating with lashes that the Jews did. He said he even had physical marks upon his body because he's completely sold unto the Lord. And now he said in verse 18, in verse 18 he says, brethren, he calls them brethren now. If you get away from that circumcision and you get totally to the, uh, to the cross of Christ and all your faith all your trust, all your confidence is in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I call you, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That amen is not good enough. The inheritance of the transformed Israel of 
God. We're looking at uh, we're looking at Philippians chapter four. As I said already, as many as walk by this road, peace be unto you and mercy and upon the Israel of God. This is a peace we have, and this is the inheritance we have. Peace in the heart, peace in the soul, peace in the family, peace in the church, and peace everywhere. So he says in Philippians chapter 4, reading from verse 7, and the peace which passes all understanding. The peace that is so deep and so high and so broad, the peace in the heart, the peace in the soul, that circumcision could not give. The people who had circumcision, they were still torn apart and there was no peace in their heart. There was confusion in their heart. But those who believed on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. And then in verse 8 it says, finally brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, and whatsoever things are just, and whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think and meditate and plan your life and pin your life. On these things, circumcision did not bring peace. Circumcision did not bring that which is true and that which is honest. All those Pharisees that were dishonest, all those Pharisees that were hypocritical, were they not circumcised? They were circumcised. All that could not bring what is true, cannot bring what is honest and whatsoever just and whatsoever is pure and whatsoever is lovely whatsoever of good report whatsoever be of virtue all that circumcision could not bring that but their faith in Christ a definite experience through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ brought peace to their heart and brought them now to a life that is lived on the basis of the virtue of heaven. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, those things which, which he have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. We we'll come to uh, Colossians chapter 3. We're we'll reading from verse 15. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. No conflict, no fighting, no violence, no confusion, and no discord. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Anything you do, Look at the cross. See what Christ has done. He's nailed all that confusion. He's nailed all that hatred. He's nailed all that animosity to the cross. And because of that, now you believe in the cross. And you walk by the provision of the cross. Then let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful look at verse 16 in verse 16 and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your heart to the Lord verse 17 in verse 17 and whatsoever ye do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him verse 23 in verse 23 and whatsoever ye do do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, verse 24, in verse 24, knowing that of the Lord he shall receive 
the reward of the inheritance, the inheritance of true saints, the inheritance of true Israel of God, of transformed Israel of God, of the triumphant Israel of God. Ye shall receive the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Isaiah chapter 26, we're reading from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose might is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust in Christ. Believe in Christ. It's a savior. It's a sanctifier. It's the supplier of the grace of God in our lives. And as we trust him, peace in your heart. Peace in your home. And peace all through your life in Jesus' name. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is staged on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, trust ye in the Lord forever. You've trusted him, keep on trusting. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Through Calvary and through Christ, through his sacrifice, through his substitution, he has provided everything for us that we need in life, that we need for godliness. And you are complete in him. Look up to him. He will supply all the needs of your life from now, henceforth, forever, until you get to heaven in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and thank him for what he has taught us and bring everything back to heart and pray so that you will have the result, the reward, the provision of what Christ has done for you, provided for you on the cross of Calvary.